Okay, welcome um, to our audience and welcome to our panelists for today's um, presentation by Elizabeth Cohen uh, on her new book. I think it's her fourth book, if I have that right. Um, Illegal, How America's Lawless Immigration Regime Threatens, Threatens Us All. Elizabeth comes here as a professor of political science from Syracuse University. She'll speak briefly about the book and then um, uh, we'll have Maggie Peters from UCLA as our discussant to give some comments on it. And at that, that point, we'll then open it up to the audience for questions. So at any point you have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can hold them and use the, the Q&A function, hand raising function for the discussion that follows. Um, um, did I forget anything? Anyway. <laughs> we we want to have, all right. So we're really happy to have you here with us from across the country. Thank you, Elizabeth, <laughs> and take it away. Thank you so much, um, Marjorie. And I want to thank um, Roger and uh, Maggie um, and Warren and Sophia, everybody for creating the space and for the invitation. I think I also owe uh, Claire Adida a debt of gratitude. I'm super happy to be here. We were just discussing um, that it's really amazing to be able to do this during the semester. Uh, and um, so I really appreciate the chance to um, talk about some recent public scholarship of mine. And I would like to preface this by saying I'm a political theorist. Uh, I'm interested in immigration, but mostly I write about citizenship and rights and also about waiting periods and time from a rather abstract perspective. So this is somewhat of a um, second vein of research for me, but I did it because I thought we really needed to be using our platforms such as they are to do, um, to perform public engagement and really to try and move the needle on immigrant rights and immigration related um, issues. And so some of what's in the book is, is kind of startling and new to a lot of people. Uh, I suspect in our audience today, there will also be things that I say in the book and that I say today that you already know. Um, and I, you know, we can focus on kind of the more technical things since this is a, a research group, or we can focus on the bigger picture. I'm, I'm happy to take it in any direction. Um, I also want to start by saying like the, the story that I tell in the book is really not a story about Donald Trump's presidency or legacy. It is a story about um, the first part of the 20th century. And it is really a story about Bill Clinton and George Bush and Barack Obama and now Joe Biden. Um, and it's, it's our story. These are things that many of us have been party to and, and um, ha happened under our watch. And uh, you know, if we don't like this story, it's only we can rewrite this ending. Um, but Donald Trump did not get us into the position we're in at all. He was given almost every opportunity that he took. Uh, and very little, I think, has changed for foreign-born persons in the U.S. or trying to get into the U.S. during the first months of this comforter-in-chief <laughs> presidency, right? So children are still being de facto separated from family at the border. I think we learned today that around 2,000 children who were turned away with family by the Biden Customs and Border Protection have returned to the US unaccompanied in order to try and enter um, or in order to enter. Refugees are still waiting for clearance and camp. Private companies are still putting heads in beds in immigration prisons. And the government is still trying to exert eminent domain authority to take away property from landowners, like lots and lots of things that were really made possible by Bill Clinton, George Bush, Barack Obama. Um, aren't really even right now in discussion or in negotiation. So, you know, um, this is where we are and it's in many ways where we've been for a while. So I wanna start the substance here with some general facts about where things stand in the US today. And um, then I want to just take a step back, do a little bit of history uh, to talk about how we got here. And then I do in the book suggest a way forward and, and that part, um, uh, I'd, I'll end with. So, you know, some basic facts. Um, the undocumented population in the U.S. stopped growing in around 2007. It's declined since then probably around 13 percent. And, um, and the number of people arrested for entering the country without a valid visa or inspection by a USCIS agent, um, I mean, as opposed to overstaying a visa, is as low as it's been since the 1970s. 
all of this was true before Trump started any of his border buildup. And data from Pew Hispanic Center for Migration Studies, um, Mexican Migration Project, and DHS, excuse me, DHS itself all show this downward trend in undocumented immigration. Decline started around 2000. It picked up momentum, probably started around 2000, um, picked up momentum in 2008. And we've seen mostly plateaus or drops since then. Um, and, you know, this trend developed probably right around the time um, that we also saw a, a lot of undocumented immigrants leaving the country. Um, even if we account for recent spikes in asylum seeking, we just really are in a very different era than we were in the 1990s when we started to do, uh, put into place the infrastructure for the buildup of enforcement. Despite the decline, we've seen basically an uh, ever escalating uh, massive enforcement arms race that started in the early 2000s. Right now, our budget for interior enforcement, um, and that's only one of the three budgets that exist for immigration related stuff in the US, 10 times larger than the budget for the entire INS that did all three of those functions um, back in 1993. They're taking money from Coast Guard, from the Army, from other security uh, agencies. So um, it's really, really consuming a lot of resources. Uh, as almost everybody here I'm sure knows, there are three main agencies that address immigration-related issues in the US. So we have Customs and Border Protection, CBP, we have Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and then USCIS, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, I think probably if we're all in the places where I am and where the talk is taking place or near there. In fact, I would be willing to bet almost everybody attending this webinar is in the CBP 100 mile zone, um, 100 miles in from the perimeter, the entire perimeter of the United States. So um, we were just discussing that we actually see Customs and Border Protection a lot in Syracuse, New York. Um, they look for people who are undocumented, particularly people who may be working in the dairy industry around here, but there's lots of undocumented people who might have reason to need to travel through or to or from Syracuse. <clears throat> ICE is placing in the interior, dealing with a lot of the detention and deportation, and then USCIS does whatever welcome mat provisions we have, and there are very few right now. Um, and they're new agencies. Again, as you probably know, none of them existed before 2002 when DHS, the Department of Homeland Security was created. Prior to that, we just had one agency that had been around since um, 1932. That was INS. Customs and Border Protection is the country's largest federal law enforcement agency. It's actually huge. It's much larger than the FBI, the DEA, all the other federal law enforcement agencies. Uh, it's not really a well-run agency. In 2014, the head of uh, internal affairs at Customs and Border Protection actually blew the whistle on the agency um, saying that Hiring surges in Border Patrol after September 11th had led to probably thousands and thousands of agents who were unfit to be carrying weapons and a badge. Um, this is a long-standing problem with Border Patrol work. In fact, it goes all the way back to the, the origins of Border Patrol itself. But now, um, which is when we have to worry about this, we know Customs and Border Protection agents are five times more likely than any other law enforcement agents to have been arrested or to be arrested. And they have been found to be torturing people, stalking people. We've had a serial killer in CBP, um, illegally collaborating with armed citizen militias who think that they are, you know, they're cosplaying essentially, but with real weapons in some cases to try and intimidate um, and in some cases assault people that they have decided are undocumented immigrants. ICE is also enormous, big and bad, um, as I sometimes say, in some, some of the same ways, some different ways. Um, we're just holding in detention a vast number of people. There's been a dip, uh, mostly due to the pandemic, um, but it's hard to say that ICE itself has really changed or that you know the contracts they have with private detention companies are going to change. Uh, between uh, 2010 and 2016, so like all pre-Trump era, ICE officials indicated to investigative journalists that they'd received 33,000 complaints of physical and sexual abuse in their facilities, um, including numerous cases in which people died in ICE custody. And it, it, you have to do a lot of FOIA work in some cases to find out what ICE is doing. So 
it may in fact be the case that more people are dying in ICE custody than we know. A good deal of the approximately 18 billion we're spending on enforcement every year ends up in the hands of executives who run the private detention and monitoring facilities that ICE relies heavily upon. Um, Biden has committed to ending private detention facilities for federal prison inmates, but ICE is really like a bigger part of those um, arrangements. And as far as we know, um, that's not ending anytime soon. I'd also like to draw attention to uh, the fact that the companies that run these facilities, uh, particularly Core Civic, also sell to people who have to wear electric monitoring equipment, that equipment. And I started writing this book. I really did not realize how dangerous that um, electronic monitoring can be, but in fact, it malfunctions and sends incorrect information about people who have to pay for it again themselves on a pretty regular basis. So um, not only are these companies making money from it, but in many cases, it's not even really achieving what it's supposed to achieve. Um, it, it also is an a really gross invasion of pr pr privacy in ways that affect people who are wearing it, but then also, um, a lot of people around them as well. In 2017, things got so bad that um, a group of employees in the sub agency that does Homeland Security investigations, so really like the basic, um, the basis for the creation of DHS is now a tiny sub agency within ICE, um, Homeland Security investigations wrote to Kirsten Nielsen and actually asked to separate from ICE because they felt so um, strongly that being a part of ICE was making it, like damaging their reputations and making it impossible for them to do their jobs. <clears throat> um, I think it's, it's super important to remember that uh, this is something that affects not just non-citizens, but also US citizens as well. We got a report, a complaint yesterday, I assume, um, people may have heard about, but that like basically a complaint saying, please stop deporting very young US born, US citizen children without their documentation. So people are um, very young children, in many cases, babies are being deported with non-citizen parents and not being given documentation of their, um, of their citizenship in the US. And that's going to if past experience dictates or is correct, that will prove to be a huge problem for people when trying to prove their citizenship as they get older. Um, but this is not something new. So uh, in fact, um, we have some studies that show that there have been large numbers of people in the United States targeted for deportation for a long time. Um, there's an ACLU study that shows just in one Miami detention facility, dozens of US citizens who've been targeted for, um, for deportation. And um, we've also seen, there's a, a Cato study as well that shows um, in uh, Harris County, Texas, like really large numbers of people have been targeted for deportation. <clears throat> um, and I don't really think we can honestly say we've seen any indication that President Biden or any of the people um, who he's working with so far really wanna back off from the larger stance of aggressive enforcement. In fact, border security has been a phrase we've heard from a lot of Democrats, both during the Trump, um, Trump administration and since um, we're starting, like I saw Schumer yesterday kind of um, making some friendlier noises, but, but border security has been something embraced by a number of prominent Democrats and it has been at least since Clinton, Bill Clinton's presidency. Uh, Biden has proposed a plan for regularizing undocumented immigrants in the United States today, but it's not really predicated on um, less aggressive enforcement. It's in many ways probably is a call for certain types of more aggressive enforcement. Um, Biden has also supported and continues to support more temporary short-term worker visas for people coming into the US. And again, it is very safe to assume that if we invite people into the US with no pathway to ever regularizing for short-term work opportunities, given the way human beings' lives unfold, that will lead to some people becoming undocumented. We know that a large proportion of our current undocumented population um, are people who entered with visas and then um, overstayed their visas or in some other way became undocumented. 
And so, you know, that guarantees, again, that there will be more justifications offered for growing and maintaining our enforcement machine. So let me just step back just very briefly and look at this in a little bit of historical context. Um, people argue about this, but I um, pin the date of the invention of um, what is often colloquially and um, unkindly known as illegal immigration. Uh, the crime itself only becomes a crime in 1929 when there are penalties imposed by Congress uh, for being in the country without or entering the country without proper papers. And when we, so we had closed the borders in 1924. Um, and when we reopened the borders in 1965, after those many decades of fairly closed borders, the congressman who agreed to do so um, really very deliberately and openly chose a way of doing so that they thought incorrectly would guarantee that immigrants from countries that had been sending immigrants you know, for decades, European countries um, would be, would kind of compose the population of people who continue to come. Um, and I, I just say this because I think it, it kind of um, demonstrates that we have this sense of ourselves as an immigrant nation that's quite complicated and, and circumscribed in a lot of ways. And much of what people don't like about immigration enforcement and nativism right now is um, very much a part of the tradition of this immigrant nation, um, country of immigration. <clears throat> One thing though, that I think has really dramatically changed in, uh, changed in the middle of the 20th century is our commitment to allowing people who are here to stay. And for most of US history, it was considered really important to try and attract immigrants to the United States who explicitly said that becoming a citizen and committing to the de democracy was um, their intent, that that's what they wanted to do. And in the 1940s, I think we really make a dramatic shift with our um, uh, the creation of Bracero and HG visas. We shift from being a country where permanence was really important to one in which we were really starting to look for people who would explicitly say that they did not plan to stay in the United States. And that only proliferates after 1965. And as you can see with Biden's immigration proposals, it remains a really important part of how we think about, um, about the border and about people trying to enter the United States. But I think one thing we know is that if we are going to put into place rules that say that people can enter the country, but they absolutely cannot stay and they will never be given a legal status that allows them to stay in the country, that it is a foregone conclusion that the story of the 21st century will be one of enforcement. We're going to have to enforce as long as we're committed to lots and lots of short-term visas and then keeping almost everyone else out. So we can talk about you know, the refugee cap that the Trump administration set. We can talk about closing off opportunities for asylum. Um, but like, you know, I think the fact that that is not changing indicates that we are still in, very much in an enforcement moment. Um, Title 42, which is probably illegal, um, is still in place and children are still effectively being separated from their families. And we have, this, have had this back and forth over in the first few months of the Biden administration about the refugee cap, which we were told would be set to about 120. Last, you know, then he backed off of that entirely and said he'll keep Trump's cap, um, which is under 20,000. And then last week they made an announcement that we would go to 62.5. And in the announcement itself, they said, sadly, we will not meet this cap, which of course, anybody who works in refugee resettlement could have told you because the process is really complicated and takes a long time. Um, so like, I think we're in this moment where, again, I, probably people in this webinar don't think this, but the, a lot of the general public really wanted to believe that Trump was, was the story here and that the Republican party maybe is the story. Um, but I'm like, we are the story, it's all of us. And no matter which political party somebody supports, um, nativists and restrictionists and really counterproductive policies are being pursued in our name. Um, and ICE and CBP are still largely unmonitored. <clears throat> um, so this leaves us with a dilemma and the dilemma is about where to go. And so the last um, little bit of this talk, I wanted to talk about the proposal that I make in the book. And, um, and I, I 
really hope, you know, that this is the one part of the work I really hope to be able to pursue. I, I, I hope not to have to pursue a lot more work about enforcement violence, um, although for the short term anyway, that seems likely. But um, I'd like to talk about regularization. So we have on the table this idea of another um, larger, but I think basically 1986 IRCA style regularization, less circumscribed and um, uh, possibly qualifying more people, unlikely to be accepted by the current Republican party, but it's still on the table, that's what we're talking about. And one-time regularizations um, are good for some people, but I don't know if they're really good for the way we think about citizenship and immigration more generally. So in the book, um, what I do is I go back to that law in 1929 that um, in which penalties were created, this act called the Registry Act. Um, and it was really interesting to me because an, um, this other half of the Registry Act exists that isn't really about undocumentedness um, and penalties. It's about relief for people who've been in the country for a long period of time. In that case, um, there was a, a widespread acknowledgement that we don't, we weren't really doing a very good job of offering documents to people and then checking those documents. So there were people in the country who hadn't had the opportunity to enter with the proper inspection and papers. And there were also, and Congress, while discussing this, is very aware of this, people who had simply entered in ways that were considered irregular. And um, the floor debates about this, like the floor debates about registry in general are extremely nativist and there's nothing to like about them. But one of the things I find interesting is that there's also this kind of um, reading of letters from constituents who are settled in the US and are really worried about being deported or having to live in the US kind of um, without papers and never knowing what's going to happen to them next. And, so they're writing these letters to their congressmen who they consider to be their representatives, right? They consider themselves to be constituents because they um, put down roots and congressmen are reading them out or referring to them and saying like, it, it would be extremely un-American, it would be appalling and embarrassing to turn down my constituents who have been Americans, even if they don't have um, authorization and, and papers. Um, to have to, to say to them, no, we can't help you. And so in this Registry Act, they create a provision that people who had been in the United States at that point since 1921 um, would become eligible for of, like the 1929 version of pathway to citizenship. Um, and so that's like, in a way, a one-time amnesty, right? Because it pins the state to 19. 21 and it's 1929 and as we know time only marches forward so it's only going to attenuate the opportunities over time but we do update the registry date four times um, and most recently we updated it in 1986 during the discussions for IRCA uh, we updated it to 1973 um, which I'm sad to say because that's right around when I was born <laughs> it's really a long time ago now <laughs> Um, so it's not of much use. Like I've seen immigration lawyers online saying it's like a, you know, finding a unicorn, finding somebody who qualifies for registry now. But I think that we should be rethinking registry. And um, some things I think are good about registry, they tend to require, it tends to require a period of residency, which is already a principle very well respected in not just US naturalization law, but you know, the world over, this idea that a period of residency um, qualifies somebody for citizenship is very universally respected. The other thing about registry is it doesn't have to be a one-time amnesty. We could, in fact, decide we're going to set ourselves a schedule for updating registry every so often and there, thereby provide a way for people to become citizens after they've lived in the United States for a period of time without um, regard for whether they've over at some point overstayed a visa um, or entered the United States without an inspection. Um, our other option is to kind of continue as is, at least since 1986, if not earlier, um, constantly investing more and more in enforcement and never really addressing the fact that we live in the 21st century and mobility is just a fact of life. Um, 
I also think it's worth pointing out, I don't personally believe human beings should have to prove their usefulness and their economic productivity to be allowed to exist, but we do know that the US economy benefits in all kinds of ways, not only when we have more open immigration, but when we ensure that foreign-born persons in the US have legal status and can naturalize. And a one-time amnesty just doesn't accomplish all of that. Um, so that in a nutshell is the policy proposal that I think is the most important um, that I provide as a way forward in the book. Uh, I want to just say one more thing before we end, and that is um, when I give public talks on this to people who are interested in immigration but not necessarily research experts, uh, a question I often get is if I am one of those crazy open borders people. <laughs> so I just wanna speak to that. Um, before it, it comes up and say something. Um, I, in the book, include just a really alarming um, set of illustrations of how out of control our immigration enforcement system is. There's a lot more. I had to edit a lot out. Um, and I think anything that requires such huge budgets, military grade weapons, the appropriation of private and public land for fortified walls, the incarceration of millions of people and lifelong trauma to children and adults has to justify itself. Um, I'm not really interested in litigating open or closed borders. I just think if you want billions of dollars for something like this, you have to prove that it's doing some good. So I personally think, um, personally and professionally think that the person defending the status quo has to show me a time in US history when border control and enforcement accomplish something. And that actually turns out to be very hard to do. If you wanna lock up families, lock up toddlers, send toddlers into court to um, be defended or to have their rights defended uh, along with millions of adults, you have to show me that it accomplishes something. And that is very hard to do. And if you wanna turn our borders into war zones where parts of the fourth amendment are actually really not enforced, you have to show me that there's a good reason that I should be giving up my safety and my rights along with other people around me. And that's almost impossible to do. And if you want immigration policy that funnels money to a few private corporations and away from national security, you also have to show that that accomplishes something. And that is really hard to do. Our immigration enforcement regime is in a shambles because immigration is some kind of problem. Immigration isn't a problem. It's a shambles because we've let people who have private interests, whether they're political or material, steer the ship. And that's not a way to run agencies. It's also deeply corrosive to core principles of democracy. So I think the burden of proof lies with people who want to defend things as they are, not uh, with people who want to change things. <clears throat> so we've got some work to do, um, but my work to do right now is in answering um, questions and I hope um, being able to respond to some of the commentary that I hear is coming. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that wonderful overview. And we're gonna turn now to Maggie Peterson, who is going. I think Marjorie just went on mute. Um. Oh, okay. <laughs> So we're going to turn now to Maggie Peters, who will give some comments on um, this wonderful book. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Elizabeth, for your presentation and for the book. It's a really interesting um, read. It's a quick read. So if you were um, wanted to uh, give something to a non-specialist, like or you know, family member on this topic, I highly recommend it. It could also be good in an undergrad class. It's not too technical, but really goes through the the big issues. Um, so let me just go through and talk a little bit about the book. So it's sort of split into two halves. The first half really discusses um, the lawlessness of the immigration enforcement bureaucracy. And the second half talks about the history about how we got there. So I think the first half really makes the case of 